Did you know the Bible speaks of three books that are to be used in the judgment? Would you like to know their titles? There's the Book of Life, the Book of Iniquity, and the Book of Remembrance. Welcome to Dimensions of Prophecy with Kenneth Cox. Tonight's subject relates to a Bible prophecy that no agnostic, infidel, or atheist has ever been able to dispute. It's truly one of the most amazing prophecies in all of Scripture. Without question, it shows Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God and the Savior of this world. I promise you'll enjoy tonight's presentation as Pastor Cox shows you how actual names are placed in each book and how the judgment will take place. You'll want to know which of the books you want your name inscribed in and why you don't dare to find your name written in one of these eternal volumes. So let's go now to the meeting in progress to enjoy the beautiful music and tonight's presentation, Book of Life on Judgment Day. Judgment Day, and the scripture says some very, very clear things about it. It reads this in God's word. It says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it is good or bad. So it says that every person, I don't care who they are, they're going to have to appear before the judgment seat of God to give an answer for what they've done, whether it's good or bad. It continues in the book of Ecclesiastes and says, For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. So no matter what we've done, whether it's good or whether it's bad, we're going to have to give an answer for it. In fact, I drove into a filling station some while back, and this fellow was putting gas in my car, and we were talking, and as we were talking, he was one of these individuals that about every other word was a curse word. You know, he just used profanity. It was second nature with him to use profanity. And in the course of our conversation, he said to me, uh, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a preacher. And he got red and started apologizing for his language and said, I'm sorry. And he said, it's just part of me. And I said, you don't owe me an apology. I'm a human being just like you. You don't owe me an apology at all. But one thing you should consider, it does say that every word that you speak is written down. That you ought to consider. God will bring every work into judgment. You won't escape it. In fact, it goes on and says this. Describing the judgment, I watched till the thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, its wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. And we're going to look at the books tonight. It says that the judgment was set, the court was opened, the books were opened. And that man was judged out of those books and we're going to look at three different books tonight and what the scripture has to say about it but it says that no person i don't care who they are will escape the judgment of god in fact it says and do you think this O man you who judge those who do such things and do the same that you will escape the judgment of god no nobody's going to escape the judgment of god you may fool fellow men you may fool your wife, you may fool your husband, you may fool your children, but dear friend, you don't fool the Lord. He brings everything into account. Now concerning the judgment, something I need you to look at very carefully concerning the judgment of God, and we're going to look at it in relationship to the coming of Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, the scripture says that he's bringing something with him. Listen, behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is what? With me to give to each one according to his works. So it says that when Jesus comes, he's going to bring his reward with him. Now, if the Lord's going to bring his reward with him, then that must mean, has to mean, that every case has been judged already, right? Now, you talk about getting in serious problems. If Jesus passed out rewards, 
and then they had the judgment and found out that somebody didn't get what they deserved, that would be a real problem, wouldn't it? So when it says that when Jesus comes, his reward is with him, it means that every case has already been settled. And so tonight, we're going to take a look at that judgment, find out what the Scripture says about this judgment. Last night, we studied the book of Daniel, Daniel the 8th chapter. And in the 8th chapter of Daniel, it said, And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And as we studied that last night, I told you that that word cleansing of the sanctuary was also referred to as the Day of Atonement, also is known as the Day of Judgment. So he said it would be 2,300 days unto the Day of Judgment. That's what he's saying. Now, when Daniel received this vision, it bothered him. Because when you come to the last verse of that eighth chapter, it reads this way. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterwards, I rose up and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Now, when Daniel says he was astonished at the vision, no one understood it, I want to ask you tonight, did he mean that they didn't understand who the ram was? Remember last night we studied about the ram and we studied about the he-goat? Did they know who the ram represented? Sure, he wrote right there, the ram is the kings of Medo-Persia. He said the he-goat is the king of Greece. Therefore, that wasn't what Daniel misunderstood. What didn't Daniel understand? He didn't understand this 2,300 days. He didn't understand what that was talking about. And so you find Daniel begins to pray that God will show him what that 2,300 days means. And it says that the Lord sent an angel, a special angel, to tell Daniel about it. At the beginning of your supplication, the commandment went out, and I am come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved, Therefore, consider the matter, understand the vision. God has sent this angel Gabriel to the side of Daniel to explain to Daniel exactly what this vision that we're looking at tonight means. And dear friends, let me tell you, it's one of the most important prophecies in all of God's Word because there, this prophecy, no agnostic, no infidel, no atheist has ever been able to answer it. It's a prophecy that pinpoints without any question of a doubt that Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah. He said, I've come to explain this to you. Now listen as this angel Gabriel begins to explain what it meant. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. Who's Daniel's people? Come on. Jewish people. He said, seventy weeks are determined for your people and for the holy city. For your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the what? Most holy. He said, Daniel, certain things are going to happen. He said, 70 weeks are determined upon your people, the Jewish people, upon the holy city, Jerusalem. And he said, in that 70 weeks, he said, there's going to be certain things that would happen because there would be everlasting righteousness ushered in, the anointing of the Most Holy, all that referring to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, if he said 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, let's see if we can find out how we know when to start. When does the 70 weeks start? When do we start counting? Well, the angel Gabriel doesn't leave us in any doubt. He tells Daniel exactly when to start counting. This is what he says. Know therefore and understand that from, go from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and two weeks and the street shall be built again in the wall even in troublous times. So he says here that they were to understand 
that it would be 69 weeks unto the Messiah, the Prince. Did you read that? Huh? Do we need to read that again? Did you catch what that said? Notice he says here, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the what? Messiah, the Prince. Dear friends, there's no one else but Jesus Christ that fits that prophecy. In fact, that text is so powerful many of the Jews are forbidden to read it because it pinpoints Jesus Christ as the Messiah and they cannot deal with that text. Unto the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again, the wall even in troublous times. So it said that it would be 69 weeks unto the Messiah, the Prince. And he said, when the decree went forth to rebuild Jerusalem, well, the Bible tells us very clearly when that decree went forth to build Jerusalem. Oh, there were several decrees, but only one in which it really took place. And that decree is recorded without any question over in the book of Ezra. Ezra, the seventh chapter, verse 12, Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace and so forth. Listen, verse 13. I issue a what? Decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you under Ezra and under Nehemiah and under Zerubbabel, the children of Israel went back and they begin to build the city, and the date on which that decree was given is one of the best established dates that there is because they have literally dug up the decree and when it was given, and that date is 457 B.C. So he said from 457 B.C. it would be 69 weeks unto the Messiah, the Prince. All right. 457 B.C. God gives us just a very simple little rule in Bible prophecy. And that rule in Bible prophecy is that a day in prophecy, applied only to prophecy, represents one year. Ezekiel 4, verse 6 says, I have appointed thee a day for a year. Numbers 14, 34 says, I have given you a day for a year. So if I have... 69 weeks, and that begins in 457 B.C., and we're going to put it right up here. All right, now I'm going to go back and read this text with you once more because I want you to get it clear. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, that was in 457, unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now, if I've got 69 weeks, how many days do I have in a week? Seven. So if I multiply seven times 69, that gives me 483. 483 days, each day represents a year. So if I have 483 years, Going from 457 B.C., it will take me to 27 A.D. He said it would be 69 weeks unto the Messiah, the Prince. Therefore, in 27 A.D., something had to happen. Something had to happen. Something had to happen concerning the Messiah. If you turn over to the book of Luke, Luke, the third chapter, Verse 1, this is what it says. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip Tetrarch of Ituria and so forth. If you look up the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar in secular history, the date happens to be 27 A.D. 27 A.D., 15th year. Let's read verse 3 of Luke, the third chapter. Verse 3 says, 
and he went out into all the regions around the Jordan preaching the baptism repentance for the mission of sin and Jesus Christ was baptized of John 27 AD he was baptized in the Jordan and began his ministry as the Messiah I mean right on the dot just like clockwork there he was 27 AD Jesus began his ministry as the Messiah now listen because the angel Gabriel takes it farther. Daniel 9, verse 27. Then he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. By the way, it's talking about Jesus Christ there. It says he would confirm the covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifices and offerings. All right, it says that in the middle of the week he would bring an end to the sacrifices and offerings. Last night I talked to you about them, right? We talked how they brought the lamb and how they offered that lamb for their sins. It said in the middle of the week he would cause the sacrifices and offerings to come to an end. Now it says he would confirm the covenant with many for one week. We have dealt with 69 weeks here, right? taking us to 27 A.D. How long did he say was determined upon the Jewish people? Seventy weeks. So if I've dealt with 69, then I've got what? One week left. 69 from 70 leaves me one week, and he said he would confirm that week with them. In the middle of the week, he would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease and you find out that that's exactly what happened because Jesus' ministry went three and a half years. If I've got one week, that's seven years. If I go three and a half, that takes me to the middle of it, and you'll find in the middle of the week, Jesus Christ was crucified right in the middle of the week. You remember, don't you? Huh? Remember he was crucified? Down in the temple, the priest is about to offer the sacrificial lamb when all of a sudden that veil that we talked about last night that hung between the holy and the most holy place, it began to tear from the top to the bottom. It says here, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earthquake and the rock split. That veil that hung between the holy and the most holy place it began to tear at the top and it tore all the way to the bottom and that priest that was about to take that knife and take the life of that lamb went running out of that temple yelling Ichabod Ichabod the glory of God had departed from the temple the sacrifices the offerings had come to an end just exactly as he said. The date, 31 A.D. Jesus died. Let me tell you something, dear friend. I don't care who the person is. The person who will sit down and study that prophecy can't deny that history, that the Word of God, with uncanny accuracy, points that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. I told you, I've been telling you night after night, you can trust the book. You don't have to be any doubts about it. It will stand. It has down through the ages and it will continue to stand. 31 A.D., in the middle of the week, he would cause the sacrifices and oblation to cease. 31 A.D., but it said he would confirm the covenant with many for one week. If I dealt with three and a half years, that takes me to the middle of the week. I've got to go another three and a half, and that takes me to date 34 A.D. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. If I go 70 weeks or seven times 70 is 490, right? So if I go 490 years from 457 B.C., 
it takes me to 34 AD, and he said, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. What happened in 34 AD? There's a young man. I mean, he is extremely articulate. He has great powers of reasoning. And he's going all across Judea preaching that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And great numbers of people are following his preaching. It upsets the Sanhedrin so bad that they have him arrested. And they're brought in, he's brought in to appear before the Sanhedrin, and they give him a chance to defend himself. And he stands up. And starting with the prophecies there in the Old Testament, he takes those just like the one we're studying tonight, and he traces it step by step, and he shows that Jesus Christ, without any question of a doubt, was indeed the Messiah. And his argument is absolutely so convincing that they stick their fingers in their ears. And he said, oh, you uncircumcised of heart, how long will you resist the Holy Spirit? And they took off their coats, and they laid them at a young man's feet by the name of Saul of Tarsus, and they stoned Stephen to death. A few days later, Saul of Tarsus is called in by Ananias the high priest. And he gives him a commission to take some soldiers and to go down to Damascus and to arrest the Christians there. Taking those soldiers, they head out for Damascus. They get within sight of the city when all of a sudden a bright light knocks him off the horse to the ground and a voice speaks to him and says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus Christ who you persecute. And he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And he said, go on to Damascus and it will be shown thee what you shall do. He's led by the hand blind to Damascus. Where there, a man of God, the name of Ananias comes and prays for him. And he's given his sight. Saul of Tarsus became who? Paul. The apostle Paul. The apostle to who, folks? Come on. To the Gentiles. 34 A.D. is when that took place. Just exactly as God said. He said, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people or 490 years taking you to 34 A.D. And dear friend, when you reach 34 A.D., there the gospel goes to the Gentiles just exactly as God's Word said it would. Now, let's go back to Daniel 8 and verse 14. And he said to me, For 2,300 days then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Well, if I've got 2,300 days, and in Bible prophecy a day represents a year, then that means I've got 2,300 years. I have dealt with 490 of them. So if I subtract 490 from 2,300 years, that leaves me 1,810 years. If I add 1,810 years to 34 A.D., it takes me to 1844. You see, it said, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, or the day of judgment begin. And what I'm trying to tell you tonight is when Jesus comes, he says his, he brings his reward with him. And I'm telling you that judgment is going on up in heaven now. It began in 1844, and it's going on now. And when Jesus comes, every case will have been decided. That's exactly what it's telling you and I, dear friends. It says that the judgment has come. Judgment's going on up in heaven now. Now, I'm going to review this real quick with you. So just kind of get hold of your seat and hang on, all right? 
You remember, he said, Angel Gabriel said to Daniel, he said, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And he told him how to start counting. He said, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, that commandment was given in 457 B.C., unto the Messiah the Prince shall be 69 weeks or 483 years, taking us to 27 A.D. It says that he would confirm the covenant with many for one week. If I take one week, seven years, that takes me from 27 A.D. to 34 A.D. And he said in the middle of the week he would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease, at which time Jesus Christ died exactly in the middle of the week, 31 A.D. That takes a total of 70 weeks or 490 years. If I subtract the 490 from the 2300, that leaves me 1810. I add that 1810 to 34 A.D., taking me to 1844, at which time God said the judgment would begin. That's exactly what he's saying, dear friends. Now, we're going to take a look at the judgment. And at this point, you're going to have to help me. So I just kind of want you to sit back and relax and don't get uptight, but you're going to have to help me. Because we're going to put the books up here on the screen. The first book we're going to put up here on the screen is the book of life. And this is what the scripture says about it. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. So it says the books were opened. It says one of those books was the book of life. Now, I want to ask you a question tonight. What do you have to do to get your name in the book of life? I'm listening. You must accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Now, dear friend, don't tell me well, I just got to be good. That won't get your name in the book of life. Don't tell me, well, I got to go to church. That won't get your name in the book of life. You've got to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. All right, there's another book that's used in the judgment. That book is called the Book of Remembrance. And in the book of Malachi, it has this to say about it. Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. Now, evidently, it says these people feared the Lord and thought upon his name, and evidently there is a book there because it says the judgment was set and the books were opened. It's plural called the Book of Remembrance, where all the things that everybody does that are good is put in the Book of Remembrance. All the good things you do is put in the Book of Remembrance. There's another book that's used. It's called the Book of Iniquity. And over in Jeremiah, it says this, For though thou wash thee with lie, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is what? Mark before me, saith the Lord God, so all the bad things that we do are written down. All right, we're going to see how the judgment works. We're going to take these texts out of the books, and we're going to put some names in them, and you're going to help me. Okay? Let's go uh, way back to the beginning. Let's take the name of Abel. Would you put the name... Well, before I ask you that, let's, let's understand some things because I don't want you misunderstanding some things. To begin with, this is only an illustration. We understand that? Huh? Only an illustration. Man does not have the ability to judge. It says that man looketh on the outward appearance, God looketh upon the heart. Okay, so... We don't have the ability to judge. Please don't even tell me you're a fruit inspector. I don't even believe that, okay? But it's an illustration. 
Secondly, if you're going to err, please err on the side of leniency. Okay? You with me? All right. Let's uh, take the name Abel. Would you put Abel's name in the book of life? Now, you're going to have to help me. All right, we'll put his name in the book of life. Uh, do you think Abel ever did anything good? Huh? Well, then we'd have to put his name in the book of remembrance. Do you think he ever did anything bad? I hear some people saying, no, it says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, so we'll have to put his name over in the book of iniquity. Let's take his brother Cain. Would you put his name in the book of life? I said if you're going to err, err on the side of what? <laughs> now, let me ask you folks something. Did Cain bring a sacrifice? Huh? Yes. He brought a sacrifice, so he must have believed, right? Wouldn't have brought a sacrifice if he didn't. So if we're going to err, and this is only an illustration, I'd have to put his name up there because he brought a sacrifice. He believed. So we'll put his name up there. Do you think he ever did anything good? Yeah, he did some good things. Do you think he ever did anything bad? Well, he killed his brother, so we'll have to put his name over in the book of iniquity. Uh, let's come on down and let's take a couple more brothers. Let's take uh, twins. Let's take Jacob. Would you put Jacob's name in the book of life? You would put Jacob's name in the book of life? Huh? Now, he stole his brother's birthright. Huh? Lied to his poor blind father. Married two women. You going to put his name in the book of life? Okay. All right. Do you think he ever did anything good? Yeah, he did some good things, and he did a lot of bad things. So we'll put his name over in the book of iniquity. Let's take his brother Esau. Would you put his name in the book of life? Now you've gotten too liberal. Uh, folks, this is only an illustration, but all I can say is this. I've read the book from cover to cover many times. I can't find any place in this book where Esau ever accepted God. I can't find it. I can read to you texts where God said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. On the basis of Scripture, I can't find any basis, and I've tried for putting his name in the book of life. This is only an illustration, but I can't find it. Do you think he ever did anything good? Yeah, we'd have to put his name over here in the book of Remembrance, and he did some bad things, and we'll put his name over here in the book of iniquity. Uh, let's, take, uh, let's take some of the kings of Israel. Let's take King Saul, first king of Israel. Would you put his name in the book of life? Well, I can read you a text in 1 Samuel, the 8th chapter, where it says that God gave King Saul a new heart. And on that basis, I got to put his name in the book of life. Do you think he ever did anything good? Yeah, he did some good things. You think he ever did anything bad? Well, he tried to kill David three or four times, so he did some bad things. Let's take David. Would you put David's name in the book of life? You'd put David in the book of life? Huh? Now, listen, folks. God said, David, don't do it. He did it. Huh? Haven't you ever read? I mean, you know, here he is up there on top of the house and sees Bathsheba over there bathing. Haven't you read that story? Had her brought to his house, got her pregnant. And when he found out she was pregnant, then he has her husband brought home from war and says, you know, you've been out there fighting a long time. You need a little rest. You ought to go home, spend a night or two at home. And the old boy said, no, I'm at war. I'm not going home. 
And David got him drunk. Figured he got him drunk, he'd go home. And so when he left the house, instead of going home, he slept at David's door. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab. Had this man carry it out there. Said, put him on the front line so he'll be killed. And you're going to put his name in the book of life? Huh? All right. We'll put his name up there. You think he ever did anything good? Yeah. And he did a lot of bad things. Uh, let's, uh, let's take another one or two. Let's move to the New Testament. Uh, let's take Mary Magdalene. There you go. I mean, she was caught in the act. I mean, there's no question about this one. You going to put her name in the book of life? Yes. All right. All I can say is when you're making all these statements and some of these dear people come to your church, you better remember what you said. Okay. You think she ever did anything good? Yeah. And she did a bunch of bad stuff. Okay. Let's take Simon Peter. Now, he denied his Lord, right? Would you put his name in the book of life? Okay. You folks are being very forgiving. I hope you forgive yourself that much. You think he ever did anything good? Yeah, and he did some bad things. Now, I'm going to give you a name, and I don't want you to answer me, okay? I want you to think. Don't answer me. Think, all right? Judas, would you put Judas's name in the book of life? All right, answer me, would you? I hear yes and I hear no. Well, I'm going to tell you a little story. Jesus sent the 12 disciples out on a missionary journey in pairs. And they went out and they came back and they said, Lord, we had a marvelous time. We saw the sick healed. We saw devils cast out. We saw m many wonderful things done in your name. And Jesus said, good, better that you rejoice because your names are written in the book of life. That's what he said. And Judas was among them. He didn't say, all of you but Judas. He said, your names are written in the book of life. On that basis, I got to put it in the book of life. You think he ever did anything good? Yeah, he did some good things. And he did some bad things. He betrayed his Lord. Let's take one modern-day character. Adolf Hitler. Would you put his name in the book of life? Ah, oh, you all saying no. This is only an illustration, okay? I understand that. Uh, I don't know. Don't know his last days well enough to make a definite decision, but based on all that we know, no, I wouldn't put his name in the book of life. Do you think he ever did anything good? Sure, he's bound to love his children. Come on, I mean, so he, he's bound to that, and he did a lot of bad things. All right, now we're going to see how the judgment works rather quickly. You see, I used to believe that when it got to the judgment, God took all my good stacked it up here, and all my bad and stacked it up here, and if my good outweighed my bad, I made it. My only problem with that is I didn't have a day that the good outweighed the bad. They, now, I want you to listen to how God says the judgment works. Because over here in the book of Zechariah, it says this. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. Boy, you talk about being between a rock and a hard place. I mean, here stands the angel of the Lord and here stands the devil. Whew. 
you know. You know, the devil doesn't have to tell any lies about any of us. You know that, don't you? I mean, he knows enough on all of us that he doesn't have to tell any lies about us. And there stands the devil to resist him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who hath chosen Jerusalem be, rebuke you. Is, not, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? He said Joshua was just like a brand plucked right out of the fire. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Why do you think those filthy garments represented? His sins? Yes, that's right. It represented his sins. Do you think it might represent something else also? I think I read you a text last night that says all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Yeah. There he stood in all of his sins. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you and have clothed you with rich robes. How oh, marvelous. You know, how, how can you ask for more? He said he just took away all those filthy robes that represented his sins and covered him with his robes of righteousness. Oh, dear friends, that's the only way you're going to stand in the judgment. Now, let's get something real clear. You see, in the judgment, if you've got Jesus Christ, you've got everything. If you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have anything. It's just that simple. You see, it says that Jesus, I told you last night, is your high priest. He represents you. He is your advocate. He is your lawyer. He is your representative. That's what he is in the courts of heaven. He can stand up and say, Father, I plead my blood in behalf of this person. Did you know it also says that he's the judge? How can he be the lawyer and the judge too? Because if he accepts your case, you can't lose. If he doesn't accept your case, you don't stand a ghost of a chance. Now, I'm going to tell you very briefly, very quickly, how to be saved by works. Anybody here like to know how to be saved by works? Don't see any hands. Well, I'm going to tell you just anyhow. If you want to be saved by works, it's this simple. You've got to have everything in this book and nothing in this book. If you've got anything over in this book, forget about being saved by works. Okay? So... The judgment works simply like this. They open the book of life. And they read the name Abel. And Christ can step forth and say, Father, I plead my blood in behalf of this man. And Abel's name is taken out of the book of iniquity. Left in the book of life, and left in the book of remembrance. It says in Ezekiel that all the good things that he has done will be remembered and all the bad things he has done will be remembered no more. That's what it says. And they look in the book of life and they read the name Cain. Now let's understand something. Just because your name is in the book of life doesn't mean that it'll stay there. Might as well get that clear. It says in Revelation, the third chapter in verse 5, that your name can be taken out of the book of life. Now, I want to get something real clear, dear friend. I don't believe in this stuff that I hear some preacher saying that you can be saved one moment and lost the next, saved one moment and lost the next. I don't buy that. I don't believe that. But I don't believe this stuff that I hear some preacher saying that you can live like the devil and be saved. I don't buy that. 
There's nothing wrong with the keeping power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The problem's not with the Lord Jesus Christ. The problem's with me. And Kenneth Cox has to stay surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ for him to do his work upon my heart. Cain believed, brought a sacrifice, but he was unwilling to surrender. And because he was unwilling to surrender, his name is stricken from the book of life, taken out of the book of remembrance, and left in the book of iniquity. It says very clear there in Ezekiel that if a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness, it says all his righteousness will be remembered no more. That's what it says. Now, again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about stumping your toe. Now, I'm not talking about when the devil breathes down your neck and makes it hard. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when I am walking with the Lord this way and I change my mind and I go out and I go back into the world and I live with the world and I forsake the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friend, don't think you're going to make it into the kingdom of God unless you come back to Jesus Christ. You're going to have to. That's required. They read the name Jacob, and man, the devil could have a heyday with Jacob. But Christ can stand up and say, Father, out there, plain, out there on the plains of Bethel, he accepted me. In the plains of Bardian, I changed his name. I plead my blood in behalf of this man, and Jacob's name is stricken from the book of iniquity, left in the book of life, the book of remembrance. When we come to Esau, if Esau's name is not in the book of life, listen carefully, any individual whose name is not in the book of life must be judged based on what's in these two books. If he's got anything over here, the Bible just simply says that the wages of sin is death. His name is stricken from the book of remembrance, left in the book of iniquity. When we come to King Saul, it says that God gave him a new heart. But Saul, and oh, dear friend, I can't say enough to you tonight about being willing to be molded, be willing to let the Lord Jesus Christ have his way with your life. Saul was one, unwilling to do that. He would not over and over, and it says in 1 Samuel, the 28th chapter, that the Spirit of God forsook him. And because the Spirit of God forsook him, his name is stricken from the book of life, out of the book of remembrance, left in the book of iniquity. Same thing's true with David. I mean, David did a lot of bad things. I, I just mentioned a few here tonight. After David died, I can read you a text after David died where the Lord said, Have you seen my servant David who could do no wrong? What? <laughs> who could do no wrong? You see, God just forgets it all. And his name is left in the book of life, left in the book of remembrance, and all the bad things that David did is wiped out. Same thing is true with Mary. Same thing's true with Peter. Christ can plead his blood in behalf of these people. Judas, let me tell you something, dear friends. It wasn't the fact that he betrayed Jesus Christ that lost Judas. I mean, as terrible as that sin is, that wasn't the problem. The problem was, is Judas was unwilling to surrender. Judas wanted to do it his own way. He betrayed him thinking he was going to force Christ into setting up the kingdom. He couldn't stand the guilt that he had betrayed innocent blood and rather than repent, his pride was so strong that he hung himself. His name will be stricken from the book of life, out of the book of remembrance, left in the book of iniquity. Adolf Hitler... If his name's not in the book of life, he'll have to be judged based on those two books. His name would be taken out of the book of remembrance, 
left in the book of iniquity. That's the way the judgment works. You see, the thing you want is you want Jesus Christ. I had a fellow one time tell me, you know, when I get to the judgment, I'm going to ask for justice, not me. I don't want justice. I want mercy. That's what I want. I need the Lord Jesus Christ, friends. And I'm so happy, I'm so thankful tonight that the Lord just simply says this. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All right, all unrighteousness. It just says if we come to him and if we confess our sins, boy, he's willing to wipe the slate completely clean. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be what? Blotted out so that the time of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. All your sins can be blotted out. You can stand before the Lord Jesus Christ perfectly clean tonight. But there's, there's coming a day. There's coming a day when Jesus is going to stand up. He's going to take off the robes as high priest. And he's going to put on the robes as the king of kings, the Lord of lords, as the judge of the universe. When he takes off those robes and puts on his robes as the king, as the judge, he's going to say these words. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Do you know what the next verse is? Behold. I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his works shall be. He's coming back. Here in the United States, one of our western cities, a man come driving his wagon and his team of horses into this little western town. The horses that he was driving were very high-spirited. And as he pulled into the main street of this little town, a couple dogs were chasing one another, barking, yelping, running around, and chasing one another. And they rounded the building and ran right underneath the feet of those two high-spirited horses. Before that man realized it, it spooked. Those horses and those horses began to run down the street as hard as they could. They had seized the bits in their teeth, and this man is pulling on the rein, yelling, whoa, whoa, but those horses won't stop. I mean, they're running as hard as they can, and it's not a very long main street. And this man realizes that his life, the life of the horses are in danger because at the end of town, the road makes a sharp left-hand turn, and straight ahead it dropped to a canyon some hundred foot. He realized they would go right off it. He's pulling on those reins, yelling, whoa, whoa. Those horses aren't stopping. And as they get down towards the end of town, a large man ran out into the street. And as those horses went by, he jumped, and he grabbed the hames of the harness and began to pull himself up on the back of one of those horses, and he pulled himself up on its back and got a straddle of that horse, and then he reached up and he got the bridle in his hand, and he reached up and got that horse's ear in the other hand, and he began to twist that horse's ear and pull on that bridle, and he turned those horses down that lane and pulled them to a stop. That man got off and thanked this man for saving his life and saving his horses. A few days later, the same man is back in town. He's at the local tavern playing cards, he and another man. In the course of the card game, an argument breaks out between the two of them. And this fellow jumps up and pulls a gun, shot the other man and killed him. The sheriff was called. The man was arrested, put in jail. The date of his trial was set. On the day of the trial, the sheriff and the deputy came and got this man to take him from the jail to the courthouse to be tried. 
And as they walked into the courtroom, the judge was making his way out of his chambers up to take his seat. And just as the judge came out of his chambers, this man broke loose from the sheriff and the deputy, and he went running down the center aisle of the courtroom yelling, Judge, 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 don't you remember me? Don't you remember me? I'm the one you saved my life when you stopped my horses. Do something for me. Help me. And the judge looked at him and said, Sir, that day I was your Savior. Today, I'm your judge. Dear friend, tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. One of these days, he's coming back as the king, as the judge. It's all going to be over. The door, mercy, is open tonight. All you have to do is just reach out and accept him as your personal Savior. As you're considering that very carefully, I want you to listen as Steve sings.